<clears throat> so good morning, good morning. Um, my thought for you that I've been working on this week or working with is inspired by the Lotus Sutra and the portion of it that is the parable of the burning house. And the story, how it goes, is that there is a very wealthy man who owns a mansion. And it's a big, sprawling mansion. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, full of incredible abundance. And there's lots and lots of people who live there. And, um, but it's old. It's an old house. And so there's a lot of pieces of it that are sort of falling apart. It's kind of rotting. And there's the strange thing is there's only one gate. So there's only one way in and out of this estate. Um, and so the man lives here with, like I said, hundreds of people and his many, many children. And one day a fire breaks out spontaneously and the house is on fire kind of from all directions. It's not just in one area, it's spread all around. And the man realizes that his house is on fire and so he runs out and, and remembers that his sons, all of his children are still inside. And he's calling to them saying, hey, the house is on fire, the house is on fire, you need to come out. Can you please come out? but they don't hear him because they're too busy playing. They're too involved in their games and they don't even hear that he's yelling, the house is on fire. They don't even notice that the house is on fire. And he realizes that they don't even really have a concept that there is a possibility that the place that they live could possibly be destroyed. They have no concept that they're even in a house. They have no idea you know, of what's going on. And so he's yelling to them and he's wondering, how am I gonna get them out of this house? And he's thinking, maybe I can run in and I can rescue them, I can carry them out, I can, um, I can, you know, hold them one at a time and I can, I can carry them out and realizes that he's not going to have the time and that there's only one gate. He can't get them all out at once. And so he has to come up with a way to convince them to step out of the house. So he promises them, he yells and listen, all of your favorite toys, everything that you really love is out here. He says, if you just come out of the house, I'll give it to you. He promises them everything that they have always been most excited about and that they've always really wanted. He says, it's right here. You just have to come out. And so the children finally look up from their games and at the promise that he's making, they run out of the house and they say, oh, you know, uh, these toys, these games, we've always wanted to have this. So they come out of the house and realize that, you know, he doesn't actually have the things that he, <laughs> that he promised them. But what he gives them is basically a metaphor for the Buddhist teachings. He gives them a metaphor for the way that it is that we get out of that state of suffering. Because the metaphor of that burning house is that this is the material world, right? And it's on fire all the time, right? Is that we don't always, is that we rarely remember that the things that we hold to be our truths in that material space are not solid, right? They're built upon the filters that we have. They're built upon only the experience that we've been given in a very, very limited way. And so we build that as our reality. We build that as who we are. And like those kids, as we get so invested in the life that we're living, that we think is so solid and important and unchangeable, it shouldn't be changed, that we don't even realize that that house has always been crumbling and that house is always on fire, right? It's that symbol that we are always in a state when we are so sure that, the, that what we know, that very limited amount of experience that we have is what we know and that's the world. When we're sure of that, is we build our suffering into the walls of our own reality. And so the metaphor is that that is, uh, those flames is the reminder that that reality is always on the brink of collapse because it's not real. It's not sustainable. So the only way to get out, of course, there's only that one gate. And this is what the teachings tell us is that there's one truth. There's only one truth. And every one of us has our path to get to it. Our individual truth is going to lead you back to that big collective truth. But there's only one gate, right? And no one can get you to walk through that gate until you're ready to. No one can convince you to leave the burning house, to leave the reality that you have built for yourself that you think is unchangeable and irrefutable. No one can get you to leave that except you, right? So the promise that's given that convinces those children to leave in the story is the Buddhist teachings, the way out of suffering, right? The spiritual teachings doesn't have to be Buddhist. That just happens to be where this story comes from. And so my thought this week is what does it take for you to recognize that the reality that you have built from your own experience, your own limited experience is crumbling and it always is crumbling. What would it take for you? What promise does it take for you to step out of that burning house? 
because whatever that is that you're willing to let your own reality expand or change or abandon it, whatever it is that you are willing to step into to have that happen, or you're willing to do and allow that to happen is those are your expedient means. That's your greatest treasure, right? So this is what we're looking for because this is the time that we're in where all of our individual realities are being pushed to their breaking points. And the more we try to hold on to them, that moment when something's about to disappear and you cling harder, that's what we call attachment. And in every teaching, we're told that attachment is the root of our suffering. So this is the moment right now to recognize that someone's calling out to you and saying your house is on fire. What's going to convince you to step out of it? And that that's what we choose as our practice. That's what we choose as the one path that we are going to dedicate ourselves to, to find the way out of that feeling that I cannot let my reality change because I don't know what's on the other side. This is how we step from that space of being the, uh, the individual self into the collective, the infinite self. So that individual self has to almost disappear in order for you to feel that that collective consciousness is you. And it doesn't mean that your actual life disappears. It just means that there's more space for it to evolve, change. Your truth expands so that the truth of somebody else doesn't push you to your edge of sanity. Eyes close if they're not already. But it's called expedient means. What are the means by which you are willing to abandon what you are sure is irrefutably true so that you can experience what actually is true? Because no matter how much we have gained in terms of knowledge of the world, it's not the same as that big truth. Can't be. It's always going to be smaller. So I want you to feel your breath and I want you to pay particular attention to that moment where the exhale is almost over. And if your body clings in that moment, if it tenses in that moment, I want you to relax. Focus on letting the breath be easy as it comes in and easy as it goes out. You don't have to know the right answers of what that ultimate reality is. You don't have to define it. You just have to be willing to know that what you believe that you know is not all there is. Your house is on fire. And that's not your fault, but you have to step out of it. Otherwise, it's going to hurt and it's going to keep hurting. This is your practice this whole morning is can you watch your exhales and notice those moments when your body starts to tense and cling because something is changing. One more deep breath in. Deeper breath out. And then bring the hands together in front of the heart center, palm to palm. And we'll open with the sound of Om. Deep breath in. And with the eyes float open. Nice, you guys. We'll release the hands, please. Then come forward to hands and knees. And start to move yourself in some nice big hip circles, moving the pelvis. I find myself these days because, you know, everything is, just seems like it's so intense. <laughs> like there's no release of the pressure ever. At least if you look outside your own door, there's no release of the pressure. Um, but I find myself running back and forth between that end of being really depressed about everything and then trying to be really hopeful about everything and then being really depressed about it and then being really hopeful about it and being really depressed about it. And that's exactly the joke is that, you know, in yoga, we say we have sukha and we have dukkha, right? On one end, there is the sweetness of things. There's the lightness, the happiness. And on the other end, there is the discomfort and the unhappiness, the awkwardness of life. Move your hips the other way. And so you think, okay, great. I understand that concept that we have these two opposing um, experiences. But what we're taught in yoga is that sukha and dukkha are two sides of the same stick. 
is that they're not so much opposites from each other as they are just different gradients of the same thing. So that running back and forth is that's what we do all day, every day. So instead of running from one to the other, can you stop and you pause and be in the space that is the middle that says, I don't know if there's a right and there's a wrong and I don't know if it's the best choice to try and just make myself happy or if I should be depressed. Neither one is the right answer. There's just the experience. Come back to neutral, please. Cat cow your spine just for a breath or two. So inhaling, lifting long, lengthening the chest and the tail, then exhaling, curling in, finding your back body. This is what we do as we run back and forth between sukha and dukkha and say, what can I do to keep this burning house going? If something's not working, what can I put in its place or what can I shove to try and shore it up? So whether it feels good or it feels bad, can you let that concept that you should be running to one or the other, can you let that go? Come back to stillness, please. Fingers spread wide, tuck your toes, lift your hips, come back to downward facing dog. Good, bend your knees a lot. Yeah, and as the knees bend, pull your hips back and then start to cat cow your upper spine again and down dog. Good. Okay, the joke is also, and I say joke, it's not really a joke, but the joke is also that we run around in circles in our mind trying to find where we can put the pieces of our life, the pieces of our experience into a nice organized order that we're happy with, right? Sukha instead of dukkha. And then something changes and we have to rearrange the furniture again. And then we're just doing that all the time. And there's never uh, even a moment where we consider maybe I should just throw the furniture out. Until we come to meditation and then we're told, yeah, throw all the furniture out. And then we like to disagree with that <laughs> while we're meditating. Come back to stillness, please. Take your hips super high to the sky, up on the tippy toes of your feet. Pull up, pull your ribs in. Good, pull your low belly in, find that Uddiyana Bandha, find Mula Bandha. Good, and then release the heels down towards the floor. Nice, and then take the right leg up and back behind you, down dog split. Good, bend the knee, kick your heel in towards your butt, stack the right hip on top of the left, make little circles with your knee. So I would say I want you to watch your reactions to things that are happening in these days and these months. But don't try to organize your thinking, organize your thoughts into a place where you're just satisfied with what you feel, that you put your reactions in a place that you think that you like. That's just trying to shore up that burning house. The mind can't think its way out of a problem that it created. Lift that hip up and open, come to stillness. Yeah, and then go ahead and step that right foot forward between the hands, lunge. Good, inhale the arms up, high lunge please. Good, left hand holds your right wrist, please, and then pull to your left. Good, so you're pulling away from that front thigh. Nice, and then come back up to center, please. Pull the other way, so reach to your right. Nice, try not to let the hips sway from side to side, so keep pulling them back in towards that center space. Good, come back up to center, please. And then reach the arms forward, torso parallels the floor. So come forward, come forward, come forward. Good, and then stretch your arms reaching back behind you as though you're gonna clasp your hands behind your back, but don't touch your hands, just reach your arms back and open the chest. So pull your chest up, rotate those shoulders the same way. Nice, now really send your weight forward onto that right leg, step up to warrior three, left thigh parallels the floor. Arms are still reaching back. Good, chest lifts. Flex that left foot a lot. Good, stretch your arms out wide, letter T, like your airplane arms. Beautiful. Nice, you guys. And then go ahead and step back to that high lunge. Inhale the arms all the way up to the sky. Good. And then take your arms out wide, letter T, and wrap the left arm on top of the right for eagle arms. So left arm is over top of right, wrap the forearms. Good. Let that front knee go forward so it's over the ankle. 
Nice. And then breathe into your back body for a breath so you can feel where there's restriction and you can feel what it's like to bring space to that place that's contracting. Good. And then exhaling, bringing your elbows in towards your belly, round your back. Good. Nice. Pull up through that low space below your navel. Beautiful. And then inhale all the way back up. Unfold the arms, inhale them up alongside your ears, and then exhale the hands down to the floor. Good, you guys. <laughs> Step your left foot forward just a little bit. Take both legs to straight, Parsvottanasana. Good. Pressing into your feet, scoop that low belly again, push your hips up towards the sky. Nice. Lift the toes of that right foot. So you're pressing into the ball of the foot, but your toes lift up. Good. So it's just changing the experience so that you can feel that there's a little something more. Send that outer left hip spinning forward. Good. And then come up all the way on the heel of that right foot. So the front foot comes up on the heel. Dig down and drag back, but walk your torso forward. Good. So you're pulling that right thigh up into the hip socket. Nice. And then you're extending, relaxing the spine into, your, into the forward fold. And if there's no sense of the ability to relax in this pose, then that's what your breath is for, is how can you change the way that you're breathing, how your mind is acting, that you can start to feel that you can relax in this position. Doesn't mean it's comfortable, but it means you don't hold extra tension because it's uncomfortable. Good. And then release that foot flat to the floor, please. Nice job. Step back, downward facing dog. Good. Slide forward to plank pose, upward push up. Lower down slow, coming through knees first if you need. Rise up cobra, lift head, neck, and chest. Good, and then release back to your belly, forehead to the floor. Keep your hands where they would be for cobra, but float your hands up off of the floor. Good, because I want you to feel that dragging back of your arms. I want you to feel that contraction around your lower armpit. So I want your back to wake up, but I don't want you to rely on your hands to create your back bend. So pull forward from your ribs, pull back through your legs, and then lift up into cobra, no hands. So that feeling that you're pulling your sternum forward and it's the back of your heart that is drawing back to almost find your heels. And then long throat, drop your chin, but pull back through your ears. That's it. Good. And you're breathing. There you go. And then release the hands back to the floor, please forehead to the floor. Bend both knees, kick your heels in towards your butt. Reach back right hand for right ankle, left hand for left ankle. Yep. And then drawing the heels down towards your butt, keep your thighs on the floor. Heels are reaching for your, for your butt cheeks and if they're gonna stay there. So draw those heels in. You can have a little pressure of your feet back into your hands, but I don't want you to lift the heels. And then you're gonna bend your elbows, lift head, neck, and chest again. Press those thighs down. Draw your low rib cage in. So again, it's the back of your heart that is rising up. Bend your elbows. That's important. You're not just pulling on the arms. I want your elbows bent up towards the ceiling so that you're really feeling that your shoulders have to, have to get somewhere. Your shoulders have to be a part of this. Good. Try and lift your chest up and back so that you're plugging your chest into your arms. You got it. Bend those elbows a lot. Good. Awkward pose, I know. And then release. Nice, you guys. Press up to hands and knees, please. Come back to child's pose for a breath or two. Good. Truth is one, but paths are many. And it's not as though we don't have plenty of opportunities in our yogic teachings to choose what your expedient means are going to be been saying that if you don't know what to choose, your one path, you start with the yamas and niyamas. If you don't know what those are, send me a message. <laughs> they're from the Yoga Sutras and they're the examples that were given of how to live a life that does not create more suffering for yourself. It allows you to find and maintain a more peaceful existence in the world. Walk yourself back up to hands and knees, downward facing dog. And so, of course, if you know them, you know that there's 10 different options between the yamas and the niyamas for what you could do. Left leg up and back, down dog split. 
Good. Bend the knee, kick your heel in towards your butt, stack the hip, left hip on top of right, and then move that knee in little circles so that you're rotating the hip. You're creating space there. And your arms remain steady. Good. So what I've been saying is that those expedient means is if you choose only one of the yamas or niyamas, it doesn't matter from where you choose it, but if you choose one and master it, it will bring you the awareness and the automatic mastery of all the others. <laughs> Lift and open that hip, find stillness. Good. And then step that foot between the hands, lunge, nice job. Inhale the arms up to the sky, high lunge. Good. Take hold of your left wrist with your right hand and pull to your right. So you're leaning away from the front leg first. And then automatically your hips are going to want to push out to the left. So don't let them pull that left hip back and in so that you're actually holding that middle ground with your legs. And then your spine can actually reach a little bit further. Because if all we do when we lean to the, to the right is push our hips out to the left, we haven't changed anything. Right? We just stuck another board in the burning house. Come back up, lean the other way. So reach to your left now, keeping the hips nice and stable in that middle place. Lengthen your spine and pull long to the other side. Good. As you're pulling, let, relax that uh, lower armpit of that right arm. So let it drop down so your shoulders soften away from your ears. Nice. Come back up to center. Take your torso forward parallel to the floor. Stretch your arms back behind you. Again, as, as though you're going to clasp your hands, but you aren't. Good. But I want you to have that same energy that you're squeezing your arms towards each other and you're lifting your chest forward and rotating those arm bones up and back. And your throat is long. Powerful. Good. Like the suggestion that a little screaming is probably therapeutic for most of us right now. <laughs> Good, and then take your weight all the way forward onto that left leg, step up into warrior three, arms still reaching back behind you. Good, so you don't lose the intensity of those arms just because you're balancing on one leg. In fact, if you keep that intensity, it's gonna stabilize you. Chest up, back of your throat up. Good, Harriet, good, Lauren. Nice, Alice. Step back to high lunge, please. Take your arms out wide, good. And then right arm crosses over top of left in front of your chest. Wrap the arms for eagle. Nice. And again, pause and find the breath in your back body. So you're not immediately trying to make this stretch the most uncomfortable that it can be. Don't run for dukkha. But feel where there's places of restriction that can become spaces where you feel expansion. And then bring the elbows down and in, round into your back, curl into your back body. Good, long throat. So as you come forward, don't hunch the shoulders up towards your ears, but stay long. Nice. And then come all the way back up. Unwind the arms, take the arms up alongside the ears, deep breath in, and then release the hands down to the floor. Good, step your right foot forward just a little bit, take both legs to straight, Parsvottanasana. And scoop into the low belly again. Send that outer right hip spinning forward. So the top of your left thigh can move back. And then notice where your knee is pointing. I know your knee is straight and you're like, oh, it's not pointing anywhere. Yes, it is. Notice where it's oriented. If it is in line with your second to third toe or if it's starting to roll inward. When the outer hips are tight, that's the tendency. The knee is gonna roll in. So can you draw that inner knee, that inner thigh a little wider, push your inner thighs away from each other? Good, and then can you tack the top of that left thigh back? Good, and first come uh, lift the toes of that left foot, so find that engagement, just the toes. Good, and then come all the way up on the heel. Nice, <laughs> exploring all of the ranges of dukkha, how uncomfortable can you be? and still maintain steadiness in your mind. Which means that all of those reactions that come up, it's fine, you let them come up, you listen, you acknowledge. But don't let them reinforce a reality, a truth, a story that isn't the whole picture. Can you leave space that you are still able to change instantly in this moment? You are able to include something that wasn't there before. Release that left foot flat to the floor. Good, step back, downward facing dog.
Beautiful, slide forward to plank pose, upward push up. Lower down slow, coming through knees first if you need, find your belly. And then on your belly, forehead to the floor, take your hands back behind you, interlace your fingers at the low spine. Good, bend your elbows up towards your ears, so almost like you're in that same position that you were in when you were holding your feet. Draw your inner elbows towards each other. Good, so you're engaging the back, point those elbows as much up towards the ceiling as you can. And then move those arms like they're already in cobra. So the arm bones move forward and rotate up and back. Good. And then from there, start to lift head, neck, and chest. Come into cobra. Press down through your feet. Keep the elbows bent as long as you can. And then maybe start to extend the arms towards straight, reaching the hands towards your heels. But keep pushing your inner elbows wide away from each other. And keep pulling your chest forward, 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 and long, long throat. Good. And then slowly release. Really nice, you guys. Plant the hands. Press back up to hands and knees. Good. Press back the child's pose for just a breath. Big toes together. Knees wide. Good. And then back up to hands and knees, please. Take your right arm out wide to the right. And then slide that hand behind your left wrist. Right shoulder finds the floor. Turn your gaze. Good, left arm walks forward towards straight. Any path we choose, if we are really dedicated to it, it's all going to lead you to the same truth and the way that you get there is unique to the experience that you've had in the world. Come back to center, please switch to the other side. Left arm goes wide, slide behind your right wrist, left shoulder finds the floor. And walk the right arm forward to straight. And if at any time you find yourself getting in an argument with yourself or someone else about the path that you've chosen, that somehow it's the wrong path, remind yourself that that's just more of the burning house. Is that whatever limited perspective, whatever limited version of truth that you now know, in this moment that you know, has the possibility of expanding with this breath, not the next one, this one. But you have to stay the course. You have to choose that there's a path that is your way out. Your goal has to be the same. Because I want to know something beyond what I'm sure is the boundaries of my reality. Bring yourself all the way back up to center. Nice. Take your right thigh in front of your left one. So uh, right knee in front of left. Separate your feet nice and wide, and then start to walk yourself back until your butt comes to the floor between your heels. Pause for a moment in that forward fold. If you can't bring your seat uh, to the floor between your heels, you can come to a block or any other type of cushion that you have. Good. And if this position is really just not possible for the knees, then you're gonna come back to sit cross-legged with your right shin in front of your left. Good, so you're in Gomukhasana. The knees should be stacked on top of each other. Good, you guys. And then walk yourself back up to seated. Those of you who are still in the forward fold, nice job. Flex your feet. Good. Walk the left arm out beyond your left hip, please. So walk it, uh, extend, extend, extend. And then take your right arm over the ear. Nice. And I want you to really reach through your fingertips, lengthen that whole arm, so pull out nice, Andy. Good, and then feel that lower armpit drawing back down towards your hip. Push your right hip and sit bone back down to the floor. Yeah, and then come back up to center. Good, walk the other way. Right hand comes out and down beyond your hip. Take the left arm out over the ear. Nice, keep as much space between your shoulder and ear as you can so that you're not collapsing through your neck. Good, left sit bone pushes down. Come all the way back up. Beautiful. And then fingertips rest back behind you, just behind your hips. Lift the chest nice and high. Lean back into the hands. And as you're leaning back into your hands, send your groins down towards the floor. Good. So you're resisting that desire to just arch your spine and pull your seat up off the floor. Push it down. And then draw your ribs in and expand open through your chest again. Good. And then slowly come all the way back up. 
Nice job. Unwind the legs, please. Roll forward to hands and knees. Good, step back to plank pose. Yep. Good, lift the hips nice and high, come back downward facing dog. And then right leg up and back, down dog split. Good, bring that knee forward towards your nose and then bring it out to touch that right elbow. Yeah, so bring it forward, but squeeze it towards that upper arm. Good, and then take it up and back behind you, down dog split. And then bring it across the body this time, so bring it forward and touch the left elbow across your body, squeeze into your belly. Good, back thigh pulls up, 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 hips pull up, 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 that's it. And then all the way up and back, down dog split. Nice, and then step that right foot forward between the hands, lunge. Good, both hands come inside the front foot, take your right shoulder up against that inside of your right knee, slide the hand behind your heel. Yeah, so you're reaching the arm around and pushing the upper chest forward, pull your hips back. And then go straight for the balance. So lift that back thigh a little higher, stretch your arms out wide to letter T so you're in airplane arms. Good. Nice, nice, nice. And then release the hands back to the floor, still with that right hand wrapped around the back of your calf. Good, come up on the ball of your right foot. So lift your heel. Back thigh lifts super, super high. Good, maybe hug those arms towards each other, bend the elbows just a little bit. And for some of you, you can rest that right leg on the uh, right upper arm and start to lift that right foot up off of the floor. So you're doing sort of a hovering split. Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta scoop into your butt big time. Yep, and if you're just resting with that uh, front heel off the floor, fantastic, nice, Alice. Good, slowly release that foot back down, unwind yourself. Nice, Dana, you're about three quarters of the way there. Good, step yourself back to downward facing dog. Nice, drop your knees to the floor. Good, take your left leg in front of your right, so the other leg in front, left knee in front of right. Separate your feet. Walk yourself back until your butt finds the floor between your feet or you find a prop. And again, if this doesn't work for the knees, then you're sitting cross-legged with your left shin in front, feet flexed. Good, stay in the forward fold for a breath or two if you're there. Good, flex your feet a lot. And then walk yourself back in, all the way back up to seated. Make sure you can feel both sit bones. So that's step number one. Can you actually feel yourself in the pose? Good. Then you can extend what you're doing in the pose. Nice, right hand walks wide from your right hip. Take the left arm out over the ear. Side body stretch. Good. Relaxing the shoulder away from the ear. Keep your left sit bone pushing down to the floor. Nice, you guys. Walk yourself back up, please. Go the other way. Left hand reaches out and down beyond your hip. Right arm comes up over the ear. Side body stretch. Good, keeping that uh, now right sit bone rooted down to the floor. Good, long elbows you guys don't have, don't have uh, creaky elbows. There you go. And then bring yourself all the way back up. Nice, take fingertips back behind you again, just behind your hips so that you have something to lean back into but then lift your chest up. Again, almost as though when you have your hands clasped behind you, you want that kind of engagement. So you're lifting the chest, but you're feeling those muscles of your chest and your side ribs rotating around to squeeze the back. Good. That's what it means, right? Whatever path we choose is that you embody it in every breath, every moment. It, don't let it fall out of the forefront of your mind. That's what it means to be in meditation every moment is you don't let that feeling of spaciousness or that feeling of dedication to truth disappear because you're busy or because you're bored or because there's a big thing going on. Walk yourself back up. This is what we practice is can you just hang on to that even though the world is spinning like crazy? Unwind your legs, please. Roll forward to hands and knees. So whatever your chosen path, you have to agree that you're going to stick with it. Downward facing dog. Good. Left leg comes up and back, down dog split. 
Nice, bring the knee forward towards your nose and then bring it out to find that left elbow. Yeah, touch. And then bring it all the way back up. Nice, down dog split. Take it forward again, but this time cross the body, find the right upper arm or elbow. Yeah, hold it there as long as you can. So don't, touch, touch, don't touch, just touch the elbow and say, ah, oh, I did it. Hold it there, squeeze. And then take yourself up and back, down dog split. Nice, and then step that foot forward between the hands, lunge. Both hands come inside the front foot, left shoulder comes inside the left knee, wrap your arm around the back of your calf, so your hand comes to the baby toe side, and then you're pressing forward, lengthening your chest forward and up, and sending your hips back, and you're squeezing that left butt cheek back and in, because it's gonna wanna push out to the side, so pull it back and in, good. And then go for that airplane arm. So you're reaching the arms out wide. So you're balancing, trusting just the legs. Try and have that left arm stay underneath the knee. Lift the back of your throat. Good, Susan. Both Susans. Good, Nancy. Good, Mark. And then release the hands back down to the floor. Left arm is still wrapped. And then I want you to come up on the ball of your left foot. Good. So you got to change, redistribute your energy towards that back thigh. Because if now if you're relying on the front leg to hold you, it can't. Right? You got to move yourself backwards. You got to move your center of gravity. Yeah. And then maybe for some of you, you can bend those elbows a little bit, keep that chest lifted, and then start to lift that left foot up off the floor into that hovering split. It means your hips have to go back a whole lot. You have to really use that back leg and pull up internally. Long throat. Good. Don't give up because you think it's impossible for you. You're right there, Dana. Good, yeah, there you go, Dana, awesome, nice, Alice. And then slowly release that foot. You know, my rule, if one of us did it, we all did it, so good job, everybody. <laughs> Unwind the arm, downward facing dog. And normally I would say that's enough, right? Let's be excited that one of us figured it out, so all of us benefit from that. When we're talking about this idea of you and your own reality is don't trust that just because somebody else is doing the work, it means that you don't have to. You still have to look at what is the way out of your very own burning house. And where is it that you specifically are clinging in your own life? Good, look forward between the hands, step or jump your feet forward to squat. Good. Hands at heart center, elbows pressing into the inner knees. As your elbows push wide into the inner knees or the calves or wherever they happen to be touching, I want you to squeeze your knees up against your elbows. So hug in. And as you hug in, draw that pelvic floor way up. So squeeze in and up, not just squeezing your butt, but internally, I want you to feel that um, deep internal muscle drawing in and up towards your belly button. And then draw your ribs in and feel that that lifting continues all the way up through the center core of your body long throat, all the way up through your throat, it continues. Good, squeezing the knees. Nice, and then release the fingertips down to the floor, please. Good, lift your butt just a little bit, turn your feet forward a little bit more, crow pose, so you're letting yourself drop your weight into your hands, come up onto your tippy toes, still in that pseudo squat. Good, and you're letting your weight lean forward as you lift your hips. And this might be just as far as you go today. So bend the elbows a little bit and lean forward and round your back so your hips are pulling up to the sky, your throat is lifting up. If you look down, that's where you're going. So look slightly forward. Keeps your throat awake, keeps your shoulders awake. And then for those of you who are there, you can bring your knees to those upper arms and you can squeeze just like in that squat and you can let your feet come up off the floor. For some of you, it might be only one foot that comes up off the floor because you're just practicing feeling your hands holding you as though they're your feet. Good, if you've really got it, try and drop your butt, lift your chest up more so you're really truly vertical with the floor or horizontal with the floor. Nice, Alice, really good. Beautiful, you guys. Take the feet back to the floor. Good, Lauren, really good. Both Laurens. And then come down to sit. Bottoms of the feet together, knees wide, Baddha Konasana. Good. Holding the ankles or the shins, cat cow your spine. Good, and I want you to use that hold like it's really a hold. So your arms stay a little bit more engaged here and you're moving your spine between that bracket of your arms, between that structure of your arms. 
So there's the lazy cat cow that says, I just want to be fluid in my spine. And then there's the cat cow that says, I want to find the full range of motion of my spine. Nice. Good, you guys. And that's something that we hold on to that allows us to find greater extension or greater awareness is that's what we call our expedient means. Those are the teachings. So what we hang on to that says, that says, I don't know the right answer right now, so what do I do? Will I follow this path? And I do the best that I can and know that it's going to be imperfect. My mind is always going to decide that it's not enough, that it's not right. But that if I'm following truth in the biggest sense and I'm open, I will keep finding my way there. And whatever is not the fullest extent of truth will start to disappear. It'll change. Good. Come back to stillness, please. Let yourself walk forward into your forward fold. And here I'm going to let you do it however you want. So if you want to come into that rounded back, I don't mind. Good. I do want you to keep your feet a little bit awake. But what the spine wants to feel here, let the spine feel. So it might be a little bit more rounded, it might be a little bit more relaxed. And notice those places where you are clinging, because clinging can be, I refuse to relax. I have to stay rigid, have to stay engaged all the time. And it can be that feeling where I don't want to push myself beyond what I'm comfortable with ever. It's the same clinging. Can you notice that point in your breath where your body tenses because it's trying to hold on to something? Walk yourself back up. Nice, take your right leg out wide to the right. Keep the left heel in towards your groin. Good, and then come into spinal twist. So that left hand is gonna reach for your, uh, sorry, I think I said it wrong. So your right leg should be out to the side. There you go. Left hand reaches, oh my God, right hand reaches for your left knee. <laughs> left hand comes behind you because that's what a spinal twist is. <laughs> Make sure that right thigh is rooting down to the floor so you're not letting yourself lean to the left, but you're turning your ribs to the left. Good, and then keep that right hand on the knee. Again, anchor yourself, float that left hand up off of the floor, and then lean to your right. So you're leaning over the right thigh, take the left arm over the ear. Beautiful, but keep using that right hand as a way to keep turning your rib cage, turning your heart open. Beautiful. Top of that right thigh down to the floor, right butt cheek down to the floor, even if it limits your side bend. It's not actually limiting it, it's making it more real. Good, come back up to center, please. Unwind your twist, walk your torso straight forward so you're in a forward fold, that left knee is still bent, but you're walking straight forward from your hips. Good. I keep threatening in my mind that uh, one of these days, these classes, I'm going to be teaching Asta Vakrasana, which is a, um, a forearm balance. So I've been preparing, it for, preparing you for it all morning, but we're not going to get to it. Lucky you. Or not lucky you. I don't know. Come all the way back up. I'm just saying that, you know, one of these days, don't be surprised. Switch the legs. Please take your left leg out wide. Bring the right heel in towards your groin. Good. And then you're coming into the spinal twist. So your left hand is reaching for your right knee. Your right hand is coming behind you. Again, not leaning onto that right hand, but using it as a way to keep your right side ribs nice and lifted and long. The top of your left thigh is pressing down to the floor. So the top of the extended leg roots down. Good. Try to move your rib cage back in space. So move your belly away from that right thigh. Nice. And then take the right arm up to the sky. Lean to your left. So you're leaning over the left leg. Good, and this is where you can tell, right, if there was that tendency to push forward through the ribs that you're still gonna be a little bit stuck in that right hip, in that right hip. So can you, again, move your ribs back, draw your ribs in, rotate the heart, and then lean a little further. It's going to be uncomfortable as those sticky places in your side waist start to stretch. Don't try to make it comfortable, but find where your breath and your mind can sustain itself here. 
because the discomfort is necessary to expand what the body's capable of and asana is meant to be transformative. Good, bring yourself up out of that side body stretch, come out of the twist and then walk yourself straight forward again. That right knee stays bent, forward fold. Good, push back through your inner thighs, push back through your groins, through your seat. If you don't know Astavakrasana, it literally, it basically means crooked pose, crooked staff. And I like it because it's the reminder that what's true is not always straightforward. What's true is the crookedness of having to find your way inside all of the sukha, all of the dukkha that is the world. And the truth is interwoven in those experiences. Your job as a yogi is to find it in all the little places that it exists. Walk yourself back up. Good. Unwind your legs, please. Scoot forward. Come onto your backs. Good. Take your legs straight up towards the sky. Nice. Take your arms out wide, letter T, or cactus arms, whichever you like better. Good. Try to find where your heels are truly in line with your hips, which means that the tops of your thighs are going to have to move back away from your belly a little bit more. I want you to feel the entirety of your sacrum on the floor, which means your low belly is going to feel like it's working, which means your mind is going to say, I don't like this. I'm not fond of that feeling of my low belly having to work and feeling the tightness maybe of my lower back. But knowing what the body's true abilities are is again part of why we do asana not so that we can pretend that we can do this or we can't do that but so that we start to really understand what we can do and what it takes to do what we can do what does it feel like to embody your practice all the time not just when it's convenient and especially when your mind is telling you to do anything but that, it's saying just react and follow it or just keep going back to what you know is comfortable. That's the moment that you bring your yama, your niyama, your meditation practice and say, mm, it's the burning house. Can I watch what I'm clinging to? And can I actively let go of it? Not because it has to disappear, but because the clinging itself is the suffering. Let your legs drop wide into a straddle. Yep, wide, wide, wide. Unless you're hitting furniture, keep going. <laughs> Good, don't let your heels fall too forward. I want them in line with your hips. So you gotta keep that low belly awake. Good, and then stretch your arms straight up towards the ceiling, deep breath in. And then as you exhale, lift head, neck and chest, reach the arms between the legs, through the legs. Good, and then release the upper body, inhale. Good, legs stay where they are. Exhale, lift up, reach through. Just making sure you do your ab work for the week. And then release the shoulders, inhale the breath, arms up. One more time, exhale, reach up and through. Keep that inner core, Mula Bandha, awake. Yeah. And then release back. Good, bend the knees, come into happy baby. Reaching for the ankles or the feet. The truth that you know, a part of you already knows that it is limited and it's not fully real. We just conveniently ignore it. So yogic practice is can I actively explore the edges of what I think I know and can I abandon that burning house so that I can find what's on the other side? Which is everything you've always asked for, everything you've always looked for, it's there. But to have it, to really have it, you have to abandon the house. Bring the knees back in towards your chest. Wrap the right thigh on top of the left, separate the feet, hug in. Good. Notice if you like this position way better on your back than you did sitting up. If you do, you're not alone. Press your low back to the floor. Good, and then unwind the legs and switch. Take the other leg on top. Flex the feet.
And so, and the reminder that the teachings give us is that when you're in that moment of feeling like something's being lost or that you're being asked to abandon something is to remember that you're not losing anything. Nothing that is real is going to disappear from, from your life. Nothing that is true is going to disappear. But if it does disappear, then it's not because it was wrong. It's because there was something that was more true ready to take its place. The whole root of our suffering is that we cling, cling to our reality, cling to the way we want it to be. Unwind your legs, hug the knees in. So the expedient means is what are you, what is going to convince you to stop clinging? Good. Take your arms out wide again. Yeah. Scoot your hips over to the left, drop your knees to the right, spinal twist. Keep the knees stacked on top of each other. Good, I'm gonna say resist the urge to use your hands to move your legs. Try to do it with just your legs. And if that left shoulder really can't comfortably reach for the floor, you can extend it up alongside your ear. That's fine, change it. Good, try to keep your knees right on top of each other. And then come all the way back up to center again. If you can do it without the use of your hands, do so. If you need your hands, no problem. And then move your hips over to the right. Please drop your knees to the left. Do you remember what I asked you to do in the beginning of class? No. <laughs> it's fine. I asked you to watch your breath and to watch your body for those moments when you start to tense because you're clinging. And if that's all you do for the rest of your life, that's all you do as a practice, that'll work. That's a path. You have to choose something that's going to give you a way to get out of this burning house because it's not enough to wait for things to settle down and for you to go back to being comfortable. Come back to center. That's just you deciding that the house that's on fire, the fire is not close enough to you yet. But it will be one day. Hug the knees in towards your chest. Bring your forehead up to meet your knees. The craziness of the world is that voice yelling to you from outside, your house is on fire. Maybe do something about it. Release the upper back, please. Stretch your legs out in front of you. Find your arms up alongside your ears as you stretch your uh, heels out. So long body like you're in a standing Tadasana. Flex your feet, dig your heels down and back, and then press the tops of your thighs down and draw in and up through Mula Bandha. Draw the rib cage down and in. Lengthen your throat, draw those armpits down so that as you extend your arms, you can feel your chest expand. Good, reach through everything. And then release and relax everything. Arms come to float alongside the body, palms facing up, feet drop open. Mind drops open. Shavasana is the time where you stop trying to figure out what the right answer is and you just step out of that reality that is tied to this body and this mind. Abandon the body for a moment to feel your infiniteness. So just do that.
very gently bring the awareness back to the breath. Letting the body begin to stretch, move, whatever ways serve it well. And as you're ready, draw your knees in towards your chest and roll to your right side. And take a moment there before you begin to push the floor away. Come back to an upright seated position. Bring the hands together in front of the heart center, palm to palm, rub your palms together. Yep. Heat, heat, heat. Faster. Like you mean it. Like you think that something's happening. If you really think that this is going to change the world, do it. Good, and then steady the hands at your heart. Because this is it, this is what changes the world. When you use your prana, your energy, and you decide that you are going to leave that burning house behind, it changes the whole freaking world. So don't think for a second whether your mind is falling into that dukkha, the despair of everything's too big and I don't know what to do, or it's falling into that hopefulness that maybe it'll all blow over and I won't have to change a thing. Can you be in that middle space that says, I am so willing and so open to accepting whatever comes next, and that if it means that it blows my world apart, then it means that I'm stepping into a world that is that much bigger. But this is what it means to live your practice every moment is that you keep that energy in you alive, the willingness in you alive to step out of that burning house. And when you catch yourself clinging, you notice it and lovingly say, oh, there it is again. One more step out towards that gate. So choose your path, whatever it is. It's what your heart needs and it's what your heart tells you. But walk it with that intensity that you are going to set your energy aflame. That's what we practice for, is to wake up that knowledge that you can walk that path. So do it. Close the sound of Om, deep breath in. the thumbs up to the space between the eyebrows. Namaste, everybody. Thank you guys so, so, so much. Have a really beautiful day, beautiful week, beautiful life. And uh, don't forget that we are here for you. I'm going to unmute you. That was fun, right? Absolutely. Thank you, Veronica. You're welcome. So guys, if you haven't seen the email survey questions that are going around that Jen sent out, uh, we'd love for you to give